Hello, I'm John Sargent and welcome to Argumental, the show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Issues like, who would win in a fight between swine flu and bird flu? <laughs> How many sequins does it take to make you gay? <laughs> Why are teenagers sending each other sex tests and what do I have to do to get them to send them to me? <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are our teens. In the red corner with Marcus Brigstock this week, it's Katie Brand. And joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Mark Watson. OK, let's kick off with round one, where we debate a big issue that's causing more consternation than asking Wayne Rooney to spell his name. <laughs> Turn your hearing aids up to 11 because we're talking about pensioners. <laughs> pensioners, forget the image of boiled sweets, benches and bowls. Today's gran is more likely to be addicted to adrenaline than Werther's originals. Swing out, sister! These days, 60 is the new 18 to 30, and the only thing out of bounds are the holidays. Whist drives are out, but it looks like Grandad's going to be coming up trumps. Hey, Grandad, you're going to live forever. Probably. <laughs> I like old people. I seem to have a lot in common with them. But the issue I want the teams to argue over is this. Euthanasia should be compulsory for the over 60s. <laughs> Proposing this statement on behalf of the Red Team, it's Marcus Brigstock. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, once you pass the age of 60, I think you know it's over. John, you have led <laughs> a happy, a fulfilled, yes. Yes. a challenging and rather brilliant life. Yeah. But I think we all know that you would be happier if we sent you to the big wine keg in the sky and replaced you with Alicia Dixon. <laughs> Now listen, when I talk about euthanasia for people over 60, I'm not talking about sending them off to Dignitas. Can you imagine dying amongst the Swiss? <laughs> what an incredibly depressing thing that would be. Think how much you would value your life if you knew all you had was 60 years. We've all been in a pub before they changed the licensing laws at 10.45. 10.45 till 11 was as fun as it got. That's 15 minutes. Get six pints in. I know we can do this. <laughs> Imagine living your whole life like that, knowing there was a moment where it was going to end. You would suck every last bit of value from it. You look at terminally ill people. Oh, the last few days are magnificent. They're swimming with dolphins. They're skydiving. They're telling their boss what a massive hemorrhage he is. <laughs> Lots of people, come October, start their Christmas shopping. They start going mental, going out, going, oh, well, Auntie Maureen, we've got to get something for her. Should we get a toaster? I'm not sure. Maybe we'll get the slippers. If you knew you only had 60 years, you wouldn't bother with any of that. Christmas morning, you'd run in and go, Auntie Maureen, Merry Christmas, I've got you a massive dildo. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, remember what I'm proposing here, a magnificent departure, sinking yourself into the wine keg of death. A warm and magnificent way to go. Ladies and gentlemen, vote for euthanasia for the over 60s if you love life. Vote red. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. OK, next up, opposing the statement, it's Mark Watson. Thank you. What we're talking about is, if I understand the motion correctly, should we just go around deliberately killing all people over 60? I think, and this might be controversial, we shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm some sort of monster, but I think people that are over 60 should be allowed to live. Uh, at least for a bit longer. I quite like old people. I mean, who here is over 60? <laughs> That's right. It, it, precisely. Would you like to sort of immediately die, sir? <laughs> 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 I love you. <laughs> I'll kill you after the show. <laughs> but even in that uh, admittedly quite alarming straw poll... <laughs> but even then, only one out of the four people polled expressed an urgent wish to die. And I'm sure that that can be dealt with. Uh, <laughs> 
what Marcus is proposing is a world in which all four of those people, not to mention Mr. Sargent himself, are put to death. The fact is, we need old people. Old people, some of the most important people in society are. Gordon Brown is 58. Under his law, Gordon Brown would soon be euthanised. Does Gordon Brown look to you like a man near the end of his useful life? <laughs> Yes, in his case he certainly does, but that's no reason to kill him, just let him go and do something fun. We need old people. What if there's another world war? From what I gather, it's all old people that fought in those. What, uh, <laughs> who's going to protect us in that event? He talked about, oh, we should do more, you know, we'd make more of our lives, we'd go off and pretend to be gay and fight bears. A lot of our grandparents have already done these things. My granddad killed a bear with just his hands. Uh, admittedly, a bit of a fluke, it was looking the other way and he pushed it over a cliff. <laughs> you know, I know for a fact that if I knew I was going to die at 60, I'd be discouraged. I wouldn't have more lust for life, I think. What's the point when it's going to end so soon? If I knew it was going to be my last day, I would just be crying, screaming and masturbating, basically. <laughs> <laughs> No, we can't kill people just for getting old. If you love life, vote for the blue team. Vote that euthanasia should never be compulsory for people over 60. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, Rufus and Katie, is there anything you'd like to say in support of your teammates? Yeah, at one point I'd like to pick up of Marcus's. Uh, he said that uh, who'd want to die in Switzerland? I think dying in Switzerland would be pretty good. Tell it to Roman Polanski. <laughs> <laughs> that was a funnier punchline than I had, so I rest. <laughs> yeah. I, say, I, I, was, um, I was very disappointed, Mark, to hear that if you had one day left to live, that you would spend it crying, <laughs> screaming and masturbating. I, I mean, why it. would you spend that last day the same as you spent all the others? <laughs> <laughs> all the habits die hard. Yeah, I know. <laughs> OK, thank you all. So, should euthanasia be compulsory for the over-60s? Hold up your red card if you agree with Marcus, who thinks the over-60s should be woken up and put to sleep. <laughs> and your blue cards, if like Mark, you respect your elders. So, red for Marcus and blue for Mark. Vote now. <laughs> It is close, but that is a victory for the blue team. Well done, Mark and Rufus. <laughs> they convinced our audience that euthanasia should not be compulsory for the over 60s. Some people say life begins at 60. It doesn't. <laughs> our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'm going to give one member of each team a statement which they must support until they hear this sound. At which point, they must perform a U-turn and argue against it. Then flip-flop back and forth every time I press the buzzer. Katie and Mark will play this one, and Katie, you're up first. I'd like you to start off by arguing that Ross Kemp is hard. OK, let's go. Well, Ross Kemp is hard. Of course Ross Kemp is hard. He's a hard man, you know. He's not just an actor. He's so much more than that. He goes into battle zones. You know, he's not even in the army and he goes to Afghanistan. <laughs> I mean, he's not hard. There's a guy in front of him, remember this, when he's in a war zone, who's walking backwards with a camera. Uh -huh. you know, um, Ross Kemp is the hardest man on television. He is hard as nails, you know, there is not uh -huh. anyone... Ross Kemp is not even on television most of the time, you know? I mean, he's just sort of wandering around getting his nails done and crying a bit, you know? uh -huh. I mean, listen, hard men cry, OK? <laughs> and that is a sign of a good man who knows... You know, I mean, I just think, is he even a good man? I don't even know, you know? I mean, I, I don't know what Ross Kemp thinks he's doing most of the time, you know? He's, he sort of goes from place to place, crying at people. I mean, come on, Ross Kemp on pirates. I mean, we know... Uh, Ross Kemp... <laughs> Ross Kemp hung out with pirates, right? And not the Johnny Depp kind, real pirates. And that is why Ross Kemp is hard. Thank you, Katie. Well flip-flopped. I sat next to Ross Kemp at a dinner party once and he's hard all right. Bloody hard work. <laughs> Rufus and Mark, how hard is Ross Kemp? Uh, well, I, I just found the whole thing very confusing because all I could think is that the sentence Ross Kemp is hard is the sentence that Ross Kemp utters to initiate sex. <laughs> <laughs> Ross 
Ross Kemp is hard. He refers to himself in the third person, do I do. Yeah. So, yeah. Can you do that? Yeah. Hound is ready. Yeah. <laughs> but if you think about it, it makes you sound like you're on gladiators. <laughs> Hound is ready. Wife, ready. Yeah. I will come on my first whistle. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Mark, you're up next. I'd like you to begin by arguing this. I wish Kerry Katona was my mum. <laughs> oh, I wish... Ke We've all said this to ourselves. I wish Kerry Katona was my mum, because then, whatever went wrong in my life, it would still not be as bad as what had gone wrong in her life. You know, there'd be no pressure on you if Kerry Katona was your mum. You'd think, oh, dear, I've just burnt the house down. Luckily, mum's done something worse. <laughs> which would be awful. You'd have no incentive to work. You'd feel like, well, my life's already gone wrong. It went wrong as soon as Carrie had me. I, um, you wouldn't refer to her as Carrie mentally, of course. You'd refer to her as <laughs> mum or that person. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that person that appears crying in my kitchen. No, it would be a disaster to have Carrie Katona as your mum. OK, an alliterative mum might be fun, but that's where the fun would end. <laughs> it would be, well, it would be awful. Of course uh, it'd be awful. Awfully fun to have <laughs> Kerry Katona as your mum. When Mother's Day comes round, I think, it's so hard to know what to get her. It would be easy with Kerry. More drugs. And uh, <laughs> you want to go to a parents' evening and her to hear about things you've done wrong. You don't want to go to a parents' evening and the teacher say, I need to talk to you about your mum. <laughs> Which comes back to my original point. I wish Kerry Katona was my mum! <laughs> Well done, Mark. Although no longer the face of Iceland, Kerry Katona is still the body of Greggs and the liver of Cronenberg. <laughs> Marcus and Katie, do you think Kerry Katona makes the perfect mum? Well, I don't think... I mean, I just think she's had a lot of trouble and she's, um, mm. and, and she's not that bright. I mean, I was told by a doctor friend of mine that when she was diagnosed with bipolar, she thought she was half bear. <laughs> I'd love to congratulate everyone on the brilliant kind of subjects for comedy tonight. We've got a kind of, you know, a drug-addicted mother who needs help and social work and killing the over-60s. I can't wait to see what's going to happen next. <laughs> what next? I love the puppy bumming round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the exciting thing being, of course, that argument was exactly like Kerry Katona's <laughs> internal monologue. <laughs> I'm a wonderful mum. I'm a terrible mum. I don't want vodka. I do want vodka. <laughs> I do want vodka. I do want vodka! <laughs> OK, time for the studio audience to decide who flipped and who flopped. If you thought Katie flip-flopped best about Ross Kemp, TV's hard case tough nut Rambo, vote red. But if you thought Mark flip-flopped best about Kerry Katona, TV's nutcase roughed up bimbo, then vote blue. <laughs> so it's red cards for Katie or blue cards for Mark. Vote now. Nice one. Even back there. <laughs> <laughs> so, a red majority there. Commiserations to Mark, but congratulations, Katie. <laughs> Join us after the break when we'll be finding out where the sat navs take the fun out of driving and what a woman like this has to say to her knockers. Don't go away. Welcome back to Argumental, the show that fights like two drunks over a can of shoe polish. <laughs> right, next up is Slideshow. One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue, but this time I want them to illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Rufus and Marcus, you're up for this one. Rufus, I'd like you to start by arguing that sat-navs take the fun out of driving. Here's your first picture. If you drive around London, you don't need a sat-nav. I mean, you're barely moving anyway. So I've developed a very simple system for driving around London. Uh, if you are north of the river, then what you're seeing is the Houses of Parliament. If you can see Battersea Power Station, you're south of the river. And if you can see the body of a blue whale covered in Johnny's and supermarket trolleys, you're in the river. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a striking resemblance, actually. <laughs> Applause. There's a striking resemblance to Katie, but you can't tell that with her trousers on. <laughs> that's, that's an otter, not a beaver. <laughs> uh. And strike. 
break up the band because an otter and I driving around together know what it is to be a free spirit, a maverick, not forced to obey the rules of the road. What do you see when you see a red light at a traffic light? Stop! Well, I see red for danger. And danger means get the fuck out of there! Yeah! <laughs> that's just... That's just my dad with my car. <laughs> Listen! When the Pharisees offered Jesus a sat-nav, he said he didn't need it because he was the way. And every man, every child of God knows you don't need to stop for directions and you do not need a sat in that vote blue. Thank you. Thanks, Rufus. Marcus, I'd like you to argue the opposite, that sat-navs don't take the fun out of driving. Here's your first picture. Thank you. Sat-navs do not take the fun out of driving, ladies and gentlemen. We know this because driving isn't fun. <laughs> but if you want to know the ways in which sat-navs do make driving fun, look at this next picture. <laughs> the flugelhorn. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> represents the one-way system around woking. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are penguins, if I'm not mistaken. Rufus, you're the expert on wildlife. <laughs> Perhaps you think there's some euphemism for a fanny. <laughs> OK, there is a picture of John McCrick with his beard shaved off and no clothes on. <laughs> now, she is, as you can see, in a sat-nav machine. <laughs> That is a sat-nav machine which is about to be shrunk down. Imagine how much fun it would be to have that pink bikini lady sitting on your dashboard saying, at the end of the road, turn left. You wouldn't argue with that, would you? No, I wouldn't. I'd be entirely distracted and crash the car. <laughs> like this child has. <laughs> High velocity, look at the panic, look at the fear. That child has a sat-nav in that vehicle and that's why that child knows ultimately it's going to be all right. It's simply typed in, brother's shins. <laughs> <laughs> it's having all the fun it can have thanks to the sat-nav. Vote red. Thanks, Marcus. Katie and Mark, would you like to add something to this? Um, what's the difference between a notter and a beaver? Well, I would have thought a man like you would have known that by now, really. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so, no, in answer to your question, we don't have anything to add about sat -nows, no. Thank you. It's time for our studio audience to decide who made the best case. So, do sat -nows take the fun out of driving? It's a blue card for Rufus and Mark, who think they do, and a red card for Marcus and Katie, who think they don't. Vote now. Landslide. A clear victory for the Blues. Well done, Rufus. <laughs> You've convinced the audience that sat-navs take the fun out of driving. I hate that annoying voice telling me to stop, turn around, this is wrong. It makes me wish I'd soundproof the boot. <laughs> It's on to our popular culture round, where our teams will be debating a topic on which I, for one, would like some clarity. Sexism. If you're a woman and you don't know much about sexism, then listen up, sweetheart, and I'll talk slowly enough for you to understand. <laughs> but it's time I stop blathering on like an old woman and learnt a bit about what sexism actually means, with the help of tonight's special guest, Tina. <laughs> Katie, you're up first. I'd like you to meet Tina. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Right, Katie, the statement I want you to argue is this. It's not sexist to compliment a woman on her boobs. <laughs> Here's a little story. I, um, I got called up to do this show, and, uh, and I was on my way here, and I was feeling a little bit low, a bit sort of 
down in spirits because I thought, I'm just going to be the only woman on a panel show again. It's just going to be a load of guys again and me, you know? And it's going to be tough because all these guys are incredibly respectful and polite all the fucking time and it drives me nuts. You know, I mean, I only walked in. Mark greets me. All right, Brand moves on. I'm like, hello. I brought these with me. <laughs> you know, I just think the problem is that young men have got out of the habit of complimenting women on how they look. And luckily for tonight, I had a ray of light in the form of John Sargent, who's an older gentleman and doesn't play by these new young rules. And he gave me a good firm goosing up in the makeup department. <laughs> And he said, nice rack, love. Not many of those to the pound. And, and here I am. Thank you, John. Thank you. Now, one woman who has not had that kind of level of respect for her very female form is Tina. And none of these respectful new modern men have told her she's got great tits. Great tits, Tina. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> and that is from the team that's meant to be arguing against this in a minute, so please bear that in mind. Yeah, but they are great You know, tits. they are great tits. <laughs> They're full and juicy and plumptious. You're feeling better already, aren't you? I mean, I want to feel them, you know? I so just, do I. So do I. I just want to feel them. <laughs> I mean, they're good. They are great tits, you know? Are you feeling better? You need a bit more cheering up? <laughs> Everyone in the audience. <laughs> you to shout now on the count of three nice tits. <laughs> One, two, three. Nice tits! Yes! Do you feel better? And I bet you will feel better. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> yes. Come on. Let's not stop there. Let's have women tell each other they've got nice tits. Let's have men tell each other that they've got nice tits. <laughs> In fact, even further, let's all be topless all the time. <laughs> Have you ever seen a picture of a page? To <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, people, a vote for red is a vote for tits. <laughs> Well done. Next up, opposing Katie and giving Tina some much-needed support, it's Rufus. <laughs> I'd like you to argue that it is sexist to compliment a woman on her boobs. OK. Uh, I think you'll agree, uh, an impassioned argument from that cracking set of tits. Uh, <laughs> I don't know really what was being said by that droney noise just above them, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I disagree with almost all of it. Uh, <laughs> The thing that we're uh, being asked to argue here is that it's sexist to compliment a woman on her boobs. I suppose we could just go over and feel up Katie. I think that would be the cherry on the icing of the cake of tonight, I think. If, if, if we all had a big gangbang of the only woman on the panel show. Well, I'll start because I'm pretty gentle. <laughs> There is an unspoken language between man and udder that has gone on for centuries. <laughs> if you're going to ruin that magic, why don't you just say you don't believe in fairies? Why don't you fart at the opera? Huh? Why don't you take a photo with your camera phone during sex, you pig? You don't say nice tits. If you must compliment a woman on her look, do you mind turning around slightly? The arse. <laughs> That's what you compliment. It's brilliant! Oh, yeah, you want to compliment a part of a woman, the arse is very much the way to go. Ooh. Ooh, I want to be friends with it. Ow! Kiss me backwards. That is... That is how a gentleman does it. <laughs> No man should have a compliment a woman on her tits. It is sexist, and it's why you should vote for the blue team. I thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rufus. Marcus and Mark, would you like to add anything in support of your teammates? I do have a sinking feeling that the, the team that wins this will be the one that A, has a woman in, and B, didn't refer to breasts as others. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I almost wonder whether that cost us a bit of the feminine support in the room. <laughs> I'd certainly like to ask what Rufus's argument had to do with being sexist. 
about complimenting a woman on her boobs. All right, well, sexism is defined as a set of behaviours that promote old stereotypes surrounding gender roles. Wow, suddenly he's done some research. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not sexist to compliment a woman on her breast. That's not a gender stereotype. Can I, can it's I clarify anatomy. one thing? To actually compliment a woman, if I may, yes. like on her breast, <laughs> directly on them. You're nice, and other such compliments, that could be construed as sexist. I don't mind. I like it. <laughs> Thank you all. So, is it sexist to compliment a woman on her boobs? Once again, the studio audience will decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Katie and Marcus, who think it isn't sexist, and a blue one for Rufus and Mark, who think it is. Vote now. <laughs> Bloody lesbians. <laughs> so, that's a win for the Reds. Well done, Katie and Marcus. They convince the audience that it's not sexist to compliment a woman on her boobs. Thanks very much to Tina. <laughs> Sometimes it's simply wrong not to compliment a woman on her breasts. After all, she's taken the time and effort to put on a plastic nurse's outfit, come to your hotel room and truss you up like the wretched goose that you are. <laughs> Bad goose. <laughs> At the end of that round, Marcus and Katie, Rufus and Mark, you're dead equal. <laughs> Time now for the final round and a last chance for our teams to show just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is suggest what argument the picture is proving. OK, here's your first picture. This is an argument for more prostitute cards in phone boxes in Lapland. <laughs> well, if we're going to do Santa calling prostitute jokes, surely it's just simply ho-ho-hos. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Huh. I think this is an argument against men asking for too much pussy. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely an argument for a bigger cat flap. <laughs> an argument in favour of recreating cat orgies using kites, but we didn't really need another argument in favour of that. <laughs> <laughs> One more. <laughs> is this an argument that literally wherever this man lays his hat is his <laughs> home? <laughs> wow. OK, that's it. So, for the final time tonight, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Katie, and blue for Rufus and Mark. Vote now. Blue boys there, going against type. <laughs> I can tell you the result is very, very close, but the red team have won the round. Which means this week's winners are the red team. Well done, Marcus Brigstock and Katie Brand. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Mark Watson. That's all we've got time for. Good night. And there's more brand new Argumental next Tuesday night. For exclusive Argumental outtakes and behind-the-scenes clips, you can head to joindave.co.uk. And next, Katie Brand is back. In you to Dave, have I got news for you.